Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing marvelously well. Ryan, how are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Mr. Who Art? Mr. Hewitt. Yes. <laughs> yeah, my brother from another mother. From another Flemish countryside. Countryside <laughs> area, yeah. <laughs> this is fun. We're in East West. Yeah. I've never been in this room. What room is this? This is five. Five? This is Studio Five. So, like, with the history, so I started here in 2001. Actually, in, yeah, I started here in 2001. The first time I set foot in this building was to install a console in this room. Oh, wow. Not this, this, not this one, oh, okay. but there was a J in here, uh, J9000. Uh, I was working for SSL at the time when I first moved to LA, and one of my first assignments was coming here to work on the console. And I became friends with Candace and Gary, and, and our, you know, our office was right down the street. It used to be at Sunset and Vine. And whenever I didn't have anything to do, I'd just come over here and like hang out. That's and great. that, in a nutshell, is how I got my shit together in LA. I started hanging out and ran into Jim Scott and his assistant had just left. And he says, hey, and I had met him in New York. He's like, hey, do you want to come work for me? I'm doing the Chili Peppers next week. And I was like, yeah, I do. Oh, that was fantastic. And that's like, so I met the Chili Peppers in this building 20 years, almost to the, almost to the week when we started mixing this record here. That's incredible. Yeah, isn't that wild? That's really, really Just cool. Just straight into the fucking history. Jim's great. We still haven't interviewed him. I saw him at the oh. uh, producer and engineer's wing party thing uh, yeah. last time we had it a couple of years ago. And uh, he's like, yeah, let's do it. But I still haven't done it. Oh, so. you got to go up there. His place is incredible. Yeah. It's so fun. It's very Jim Scott. It's very Jim. <laughs> Players. Yeah. With a Z. Pliers. With a Z. Yeah. Yeah. Pliers. Pliers. Sorry. Yeah. Pliers. <laughs> it's his friend's band ah. who, like, who owned the building. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh -huh. I didn't know uh -huh. that. Yeah, it's like the goof, goofball band that he that they that they have. That's great. I mean, I mixed a record with him in there, um, Augustana record on his uh, RCA Neve. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was fun. Yeah, yeah, he's he is the best. I I love that guy. He's one of my mentors. I loved about that was like all we had was a pair of eleven seventy sixes on the master bus, and everything yeah. else was just EQ on the console. Yeah, yeah, it was great. That's his that's his style, man. It's just like the original spank it and crank it, <laughs> 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 and it's just. I mean, it sounds like Jim Scott. There's just no. Yeah, There's no great. ifs, ands, or buts. It's huge live room. It's just like yeah. full of gear and stuff and yeah. instruments and things. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, we're talking but ourselves into anyway. it. Anyway. Talking ourselves, we're going to go yeah. and see Jim. Yeah. So, so, so you came here July? We've been here since July. It's now end of March, right? Uh, so however many months that is. Well, we started at the end of July, to be fair. Um, but uh, yeah, we've been in here since July. Just been camped out, took over the room, rewired the racks, put all my stuff in and put in John's stuff and a few rented pieces and, and uh, just started mixing, you know, started mixing this new Chili Peppers record. But were you tracking it before? Yeah, I cut the whole thing. Um, nice. We, we recorded at, uh, at Shangri-La, Rick Rubin's place up in Malibu. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it was an adventure, man. We were up there for nine months. The vocals were done in Hawaii. Very, very nice sort of pace that they had down there in Hawaii with Rick and, and Anthony and uh, an engineer, young engineer. Uh, cut the vocals down there, but I did pretty much everything else. So, Fantastic. Yeah, it's, man, it's, yeah, it's it's pretty awesome. It's really nice to, like, have the run, you know, like, start it, finish it. That and, is beautiful, like, yeah. And, you know, do do the whole thing. What, is, what does he, Rick have? Does he have a Neve in there in Shangri-La? What does he have? No, he's got a, it's an API. I think it's from, like, 1969. It's oh. old. It's a flat desk, you know, with the big bus buttons, a 16 bus console uh it's like 32 channels but you know with this band and and working on tape it wasn't it's not set up for that because i mean of course it comes from the era of tape but it's been chopped and channeled and modified and all this other stuff and, and it's very difficult to work on that console with a you know needing 24 faders for for the tape returns so we brought in you know he's got a stack of 1073s and i brought in a bcm 10 sidecar nice you know so i could do the drums and sort of sum the drums on that i you know again we're on tape so, you, you know, you only Just have so one, many tracks. One, one twenty-four you know, track? Yeah, well, we started with one and yeah. then, you know, did overdubs on, onto a, a work tape on the other machine. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, you got to get the sound on the way in because there's no, you know, there's no fix it later. You know, yep. there's yeah. no there's no plugins that you can just like, oh, well, I'll, I'll just fix that as we go. It's like you got to get the sounds going into the tape. And, uh, and get it going. And I like to bust stuff together and do parallels and stuff like that. So having Fun. a console that I can bust things and, and have aux ends and stuff was, was crucial to getting that done. I think people forget that there are bands that are still making records on tape without making a deal about the fact that they're making a record on the tape. Yeah. 
It's just how, it's how they want to do it. It's putting a limit on mm -hmm. what you're able to do. So you, as the musician, as the engineer, have to show up with all of your power and know if something sounds good, if a performance is good enough, if, mm -hmm. it, if, it, if, if the thing you've just done is the thing you want. Like because you can't just make a decision later. Like, oh, we'll just put it everywhere and figure it out later. Because it's like, well, you can't put it everywhere because we've only got this many tracks and this many minutes of tape, yep. you know? Uh, or like, oh, we'll just fix that. Like, let's just, you know, blah, 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 blah. And again, it's not a, it's, I, I will never say anything bad about digital recording or the people who do it because I do it all the time. I fix shit. I use samples. I use all these things, the tools that we have. But John's thing is not doing that. Right. You know, and yes, we'll comp solos, of course, you know, but you know, more often than not, he's like, punch me in when I go, nah. and I have to memorize his solo and punch in at precisely the right moment. Otherwise, I f***ed it up, you know, and now we've got to start all over again. So, I mean, there was, there was a solo on the record. I think I punched into the same spot probably 50 times. Wow. And I didn't miss, <laughs> you know, because you're like, you have to know. And I mean, the first time around, like when I started with them 20 years ago, I didn't know. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't understand inversions within chords. I'm like, you're changing that. What? I don't even know what's happening here. But you know, in the in the ensuing time, I've learned a lot more. So, and 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 I got the call for this gig because he and I had a way of working together. You know, and understanding. Like we don't we we communicate non-verbally when we're in the studio. Sure. You know, I, I'm sort of ranting on this. Sorry, but no, no, it, no, it makes perfect the, sense. The the purpose of analog recording for him again, just going back to that, is 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 forcing yourself mm -hmm. to know what's happening, yeah. you know? And, and I tell you, like the last year and a half of not looking at a screen all the time has been a miracle. It's been so nice, That's you know? And to have that break of rewinding and having to remember things about all these different songs, which I didn't score a hundred on. I got a B minus, I think, about remembering things within songs. <laughs> but John was A plus. Like, he's like, oh, well, that's the one where we did blah, 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 blah. Don't you remember blah, blah, blah? I'm like, nah, I completely forgot. But I know I could tell you where the chorus starts at 135, you know, <laughs> you know, on the tape machine. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's like, it's incredible to, to make the record and, and, like you say, not make a, a story like, hey, look what we're doing. It's just, this is how we do it. And, and also, by the way, having a band playing live in the room and not making a thing of it. Yeah. Playing yeah. with no click track and mm -hmm. not making a thing of it. It's just how they do it. Yeah. And people get scared. People get so scared. Oh, I can't play without a click. And again, nothing against people who play with click track. It's amazing. It's a great tool. But these guys, when they play to a click, don't sound like the same band. Mm -hmm. It's wild. And, you know, like, let's try it. Let's try it on a click. And all of a sudden, it was just like it could have been any band, mm -hmm. you know? But the, the way that they move together and respond to each other's playing is like, Makes, yeah. Oh my God. Makes perfect sense. I remember playing bass and nobody ever, we didn't have a discussion about like whether the kick was, it was like, no, my job was to be just behind the kick. You yeah. Know, kick plays bass. Yeah. Yeah. You know, nobody ever said, oh, because I think the kick might be a nanosecond early. You let know? me, let it, me look at this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and again, job? guilty. Yeah. Guilty. You yeah, know, like too. when you have these tools and when you go down that yeah. rabbit hole, yeah. it's easy to lose yourself. And it, it's interesting, like, you know, when you get into editing and, and you're zoomed in on this micro level shit, whatever it is, and then you zoom out and play it, you're like, wow, that doesn't even sound like music anymore. Yeah. And like, there are times where I'll be futzing with stuff and going down this very slippery slope into a pile of shit. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden I look back, I, I come out and I'm like, <laughs> this doesn't sound any better than when it was kind of, when I thought it was fucked up. So let's yeah. just let it be yeah. Yeah. as they played it. Yeah. You know? Everything just starts to get smaller. Yeah. Because everything's like, all the ones are hitting together. Nah. And you're yeah. like, you used to go grang, now it's going dead. <laughs> yeah, and it's, you know, and that can be fun. There, there's a lot of music that benefits from that kind of, you know, metronomic feel. But like when you're making a rock record, mm -hmm. you know, it's got, I think Especially it's just. a band with a I just think it, crap ton of funk in there. Yeah, I mean, when there's grease in it, you got to mm -hmm. let it be dirty. Yeah. And dirty is imperfect. And like, and what, what amuses me so much is people who cite the Beatles and the Rolling Stones as their influences, but then they go in and everything's got to be perfect. And it's just like, have you listened to that shit lately? It's like out of tune, out of time, tempo's all over the place. And those guys are like the benchmark of rock and roll. No, absolutely. <laughs> Zeppelin. God, imagine yeah. as you went through in Zeppelin and tried to time all that stuff up. Oh, and I mean, and just listen to some of the edits they made mm -hmm. that are just like <laughs> blunt cut edits between songs that were recorded in different places. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's, it's exciting and it's 
dirty. <laughs> I love reading about the Yes album, and I, I, I can't remember what the, which track it was. Somebody will know here. Like one of the seven minute epics, and oh. it's like four different ideas, and they just chopped it all together. Oh. And then they would have to learn afterwards. Mm -hmm. Was it Roundabout? I don't, maybe it was Roundabout. Oh. I, I don't think it was, but, but, but my, my point is, is like they would construct a song. Yeah. And then they would learn it. Yeah. Oh, we've got to go and tour. We better yeah, learn that yeah. song we've constructed. It's inc I, I got to mix, I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was Roundabout. I got to mix that for Guitar Hero oh, wow. years ago when that was a thing. And it was, it was done on 16-track tape. And between the sections, there were things that were recorded right up to the line. And you could tell that they had recorded these in pieces mm -hmm. and then cut the tape together. And so it makes sense that they have to relearn the song yeah. because they never played it as a piece. Yeah. And, there, and, and it was great because there'd be harmonies um, and you'd hear someone strumming a guitar and then all four of them would be on the mic in perfect four-part harmony mm -hmm. on one track yeah. and then double-tracked and so on. You know? And, and so, so bec you know, because I put it into Pro Tools, I split all these different things out and 16 tracks of a five-minute song became like, I think, 72 tracks because I had to sort of separate like, okay, the guitar's playing on track one in this part, but then it moves to track seven in this part for a different part of the song. Well, I'm not going to leave those, in the, you know, because you want to make it easy to mix and, yeah. and, and make it continuous for the, for the stems and whatnot. But man, what an education in like how people just fucking did shit. Yeah, yeah. Bass, guitar, tambourine on the same track. Totally. Because you want more tambourine? Yeah, turn, turn the top drum. up. You're, you're, on a, you're on a really positive high on this because you've, yeah. you've been on tape. Yeah. So you've been yeah. in a world now where you're forced to listen, listen, and listen. Yeah, yeah. There's no like, well, I came in this morning and corrected the bass. Right. Not to take away from this because there are kids out there who don't know sure. the things that we know from working on tape and consoles who are doing rad shit who are yeah. doing really, really sure. cool, groundbreaking stuff. And it's interesting, I met a young guy, a young engineer in Nashville um, who, who came up under, under a um, you know, big time engineer in Nashville and he makes really weird sounds. And like, and, and you know, I, I asked him one day, I'm like, man, I really, can you show me how you're doing this stuff? I love your aesthetic, your vibe. I'm like, how did you come up with this stuff? He's like, well, I learned the rules from the guys who invented them, and now I can break them. Right. You know, so now he's learned how to do everything properly, and now he can intentionally do something wrong and nice. do and make something cool about it. But like, I get a lot of tracks from kids, and I say kids, I don't mean like kids get off my lawn, I just mean young people, <laughs> like who don't know. Wait there, we're not young people anymore? I feel young. <laughs> I feel young. Um, every day I, f I wake up, and feel young, but like, but people who don't know the rules and who are making bad decisions, thinking that it's cool, right. like except like bad distortion on every track, you yeah. know, like distorting everything means that nothing's distorted. It all just sounds bad. But when you distort something in comparison to something that's clean, now all of a sudden that sounds cool. Yeah. But if everything sounds like it's been put through like a Radio Shack transistor radio, that's not good. Yeah, that's that's not pleasant to listen to. 17 songs on a bonus track. Oh, wow. Yeah, Japanese bonus track. Is that technically a double album? Is that what we call them now? Are we no, allowed to call I, them well, anymore? I mean, technically it's a double album because it's two LPs, yeah, but yeah. it's one CD. As opposed to uh, Stadium Arcadium, the last record with John was a double CD. It was 28, 26 or 28 songs, I can't remember. That's a lot of songs. How long did that take? Well, I, I mixed half and Andrew Sheps mixed half of that one. Right. So we did that basically a song a week. Wow. So whatever that is, 13 weeks. Didn't you do it at the pass? We did, yeah. I mixed I mixed mine at the pass and In Studio and T? In in X a, X, the one in the back. Ah, the mic whatever the mix room was. The, the one that had the To the left. Yeah. Eight, with the eighty seventy eight. That I, I, I mixed a live record in there. I'll tell you that room takes a lot to learn. It, yeah, I mean I liked it. I mean, it just felt immediately comfortable to me. You right. know, we, we, um, that record, we had a mix off, um, and I won, which is pretty great. Nice. And, and I did the mix off in there and I just felt like, wow, this is like, this is an incredible mix room. I'm going to mix in here, you know? Wow. But, uh, yeah, you know, it, 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 it depends on when you were there. Cause they did, they redid some stuff just before I went in. And I think right. they fit, there was like a low end issue they fixed in the room or, or whatever. But, uh, yeah, I, God, I loved that room. It was amazing. I mean, honestly, if that room was still there as it was, I probably would have gone there. But, wow. 
But uh, when when Rick and John asked me where I wanted to mix the record, I was like, ah, oh, this feels like an SSL record. <laughs> like I just sort of had a vision of like I want to mix on a, I want to mix this on a 4K. Nice. And, and you know, and we were looking at other we were looking at a few different rooms. I'm like, we got we just got to go to East West. Fantastic. Because I just know I know this room pretty well, and and uh, yeah, and and I love I love the vibe here. Oh, you know, I love Candace and the whole. Candace group, is the, whole, the manager. And she's Candace amazing. is the manager, and and I mean, I've, I've known her for twenty years, over twenty years, and so it was just it was sort of like bringing my my experience full circle to come back here and and do the thing. And it, it, God, it's been so fun, man. It's been such a blessing, such a privilege to to be here doing this. Has the horse gone? No, the horse is still there. Oh, I missed the horse. Did uh, you see the horse, Eric? You just you just can't ride it. I, I, I never. I wanted this massive life-size horse in the with a for with you. a lamp on its head. The lamp on its head. Yeah. <laughs> this is a crazy studio because it's it's got a bit of everything. It's yeah. got little honeycomb rooms. It's got the little Beach Boysy room over there. Mm -hmm. But then it's got like an aircraft ham hanger yeah. for a live room. Yeah. I mean, it's I mean, huge. it is hands down my favorite studio. Like anything you need to do, recording or mixing, like it's very hard to beat this place. You know, like they keep they keep everything in good shape. And they've got a little bit of everything, like you say. They've got a couple of Neves. They got a Trident. They got an SSL, you know. Yeah. And they got big rooms. They got small rooms. They got a mix room, you know. And the 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 accoutrements here are very good. Oh yeah. You know the the lounges are are great. And it's the hang. Like you run into people in the halls. I like I forgot what being in a real commercial studio is like. You know. I mean, I've had my own mix room since gosh, since two thousand eight. Wow. Uh, and so I've spent so many years by myself. Um, and, and and in in Nashville, there's only really one big studio at Blackbird, and you don't run into people because there's no common hallways. Sure. You know what I mean? And, and you know when I go to Sound Emporium, which is my favorite studio in Nashville, there's the other, there's the other room. There's two rooms there, and you you run into some people every once in a while. But but here it's like you know you just almost every day you run into someone you know. I think I'd like to know. Tell me a little bit about how you mix using the SSL. I mean, can you give us some little kind of little tips how much of the console are you using and how much outboard for instance uh combo platter or com oh yeah total combo platter you know yeah. i've got a, a handful of parallels set up mm -hmm. um i got two different parallels for the drums just depending on what i want i like having like a, a tubey soft thing and a and a more aggressive uh you know solid state thing so uh i have my 124s on a bu on a pair of buses and my 2500 on a pair of buses and depending on what the vibe of the song was I would use one of those or none for the drums and then like a um, sort of uh, the a parallel for the rest of the band with a 33609 that I would use or not and but yeah I mean I, I mean I love the EQs on here that's why I chose to mix in this desk and I love the sound of it like it's real crunchy and and the harder you kick it the more it kicks it back you know yeah. it's kind of like a mule in that regard yeah. uh, and so you know it, it's hard to really blow it out of the water. Are you, are you pinning the output stage? Oh yeah. Yeah, I love pinning it. Yeah, it's good. And then I pull the fader. I pull the master fader down like five or six dB or something like that. Yeah, yeah. You know. I was surprised when I was at Bob's Clear Mountain recently. He doesn't pin his output stage. He keeps it really super clean. Well, he's clean. Yeah. He he knows what he's doing. Yeah. For, me, for people I'm like just us like, who don't know what they're doing. I just the song starts and does this, <laughs> and then it finishes. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't. I don't kick it. Quite. Although I guess if you if you push the fader all the way up, oh, it's buried. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But you know, stereo bus. I had a, actually. I use. I have a smart compressor, the C2 that I like better than the bus compressor on the console, and I have a wet dry blend mod for it. So you know, so I can back off the compression. You know, and sneak sneak in the dry. And so that's why I don't need the back bus compressor all the time because I have. I can you know sort of open the valve, if you will, um, on on the bus itself. And then I have a curve bender. Um, Chandler EQ that's on the bus all the time. And sometimes I put the NTI on if I need a little bit of air on top. But, you know, I, I mean, as much stuff as I have here, when comparing to what I do in the box, it's actually kind of simple. You know, I don't have, you know, I, I don't I don't feel like patching in five different things on a channel. So unless it needs something specific, I use the desk. You know, and one of my heroes that I got to assist uh, for a couple weeks, Bruce Swedean, um, we mixed, God, this was in 1997. We were mixing a Brazilian artist named Carlinos Brown. And he came in, it was 72 track analog, three analog machines locked up on a, on a 96 channel SSL. And I swear to you, that guy used eight pieces of outboard gear on 
a giant console. He had a compressor on the vocal, barely touching anything. He had a GML and something else on the bus. And I think he had a reverb, two reverbs and two delays. On, and it sounds fucking massive. That record, it's called Omelet Man. It's the weirdest name for a record. But you can tell which one's Bruce mixed. It sounds like Michael Jackson. I, like, it's nothing like Michael Jackson, but it sounds, the sound, the sonic quality is like Michael Jackson. Anyway, if Bruce can use the desk EQ and nothing else, I can use the desk EQ and nothing else. I'm not nearly as good as he is, was. But, you know, but yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes an API sounds better. Sometimes a Poltec sounds better, you know. I mean, I have like 10 channels of different Poltecs in here and Langs and stuff like that. You know, sometimes a 1073 sounds better. Um, but generally, all the EQs on the desk you know, and I have a handful of compressors in here and, and you know, again, I love the desk. If it just needs a little, how you doing to keep it in line, I just put the desk compressor on and it sounds great, you know. And and otherwise, if it needs something specific, then I have all these flavors to pick from. And and, and it's really like painting, you know. You, you pick the appropriate color and it gives you this incredible glow, you know. And if you pick the wrong one, it just doesn't do anything or it makes it makes it worse. You know? It's all about having a good assistant as well, isn't it? Yeah, it's ha about having a good assistant. And I'll tell you what, the interesting thing about, because strangely, I mean, I, and I again, I kid you not on the timing of this. So August, so I got called for this job in November of 2020. August of 2020, I decided, screw all this outboard gear, I'm going completely in the box. <laughs> wow. And I started selling off my stuff. You know, I don't need this crap anymore. This is just a pain in the neck. And I just, because I just got sick of the non-repeatability of it. And I was, and yes, I love analog gear. Again, this is not an analog versus digital argument. But the interesting thing to me about mixing in the box versus on the console is how much quicker you get stuff done. Sure. And, and how there's no, there's nothing standing other than the computer crashing or Pro Tools messing up. There's nothing really standing between you and what you want because you can do anything in the console. And, and I love this, again, for John Frusciante's reasoning of like, there's limitations and you're not allowed to do whatever you want, so you have to make the most of what you have. It's like the ultimate argument for being present and having intent with everything you're doing. Those, those are my words lately, like being present and having intent. And it's interesting that people bust balls about templates in, in, in Pro Tools, like, oh, you mix from a template, that's not mixing, that's bullshit. That's what we're doing here. Yep. That's what everyone's doing. On, that's what everyone who's smart and mixing on a console was doing. We just start with where we left off from the last song. It's like the same as import session data, you know? <laughs> one, one, of, one of the mixes we were talking about earlier with racks and racks of gear, I mean, I think the only thing they ever did was really fader moves. Yeah. You know what? Kept the console the same. Everything stayed the same. There's something to that. Yeah. There's definitely something to that. Yeah, I've got a lot of acquired knowledge and you've, you've got to that Yeah, place. I think that what's interesting about that idea is you keep it within a certain box, you know, metaphorically speaking, because that you're always going to have the same sound. So if you like the sound of that particular person, then you, yeah, you go there because he's going to put your shit through the same shit he put that guy's shit from. So if you want to sound like that guy, you go to that guy. You know, I mean, my thing is like, yeah, I use, a, I have a template, but it doesn't mean that it's going to sound the same. You know, there's, a, there's always one guy who doesn't think that way. Yeah, Bob, and and that's yeah. Bob zeroes out the console every time. Oh sure, every song. Yeah. Every song. Oh wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, Bob. Bob's Bob. Bob's Bob. I mean, he, he's you the know. one guy we. Get. He's the one guy I believe. When he said to me, "I never solo," I was like, "I believe it." I don't think. Well, it's because he's a bass player. His bass players are not allowed to solo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ooh, good. I like change. dad jokes. I'm good at dad jokes. Ah, no, yeah. no, but you know, like I, I worked with Elliot Shiner back in the day, and. He didn't zero the console. He's right. just like, good, I got a great drum sound going. Right. Same, same drums on the rest of the record, right? I'm like, yeah. He's like, why would I reinvent the wheel? Right. Right. And he, I mean, even to the point where like, after the first mix, I think I reset the flying faders on the, on the VR we were working on. And he goes to do the next song and he's like, his groups weren't there. He's like, he literally, he looks at me, he's like, did, did you reset flying faders? I was like, yeah, yeah. Thinking I did something good. He's like, yeah, don't, don't do that. Don't, I, I have to do those groups all again. I mean, it literally took him a minute, but he's like, I, no, I don't want to do that again, you know? And he, I mean, I swear, like, he, we were working on this band that, I don't think the record even came out. Phil Ramone was producing it, and we were just gas-bagging the whole time. He was just telling me stories and stuff, nice. and Phil calls in New York City 1999 or whatever. He's like, he's like, all right, you ready for me? And, and Elliot's like, yeah, yeah, sure, come on down. He's like, all right, we got to get to work here. I swear to God, from a, he had never heard a note of this band. 
He turns around, same thing, no inserts, no nothing. Song's done in an hour and a half. From never hearing this band from nothing. Nothing in an hour and a half. Boom. I was like, and it's still, sound. I mean, it sounds like a 90s mix. Right. You know, very open and sure. airy and whatever. It's not loud. But right. like, oh, it was like magic. I was like, I want to be like this guy. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so nice. I'm sort of between him and, my, and Brower, who I came up under also, you know. So it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, 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 mm, it's fascinating to apply knowledge. Amazing. <laughs> it, yeah, dude, it's so fun. Can you believe we get to do this? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't. I mean, when I think about growing up in a little village in England and some of the things that, I mean, even just being here today. Yeah. Imagine. Oh, I mean, you know, I grew up in a little town in Pennsylvania and like, and I couldn't, I couldn't wait to get out. Once yeah. I, once I learned about music and the world, I was like, I can't, I mean, I love where I'm from. My, my family still live there. I love going back. But after a week, I'm like, yeah, I want to get back to work, <laughs> you know, or I like. Did you get to go and hang with your dad though in the studio? Yeah, yeah. I went on the road with my dad starting when I was 13. Wow. You know, like going out on the road doing remotes. And, uh, oh, man, it was magic. It was magic. And I'm so, I mean, same thing. Like, could you imagine, like, going back to school on Monday, having gone to, like, New York City to record Pearl Jam? No. I you know, imagine. or like I just spent the summer on the road with my dad and we recorded this and this and this and this and this. And then you got to go back to school in your little town. And it's, a, you know, again, it was a beautiful town, wonderful people. But like, I just got the bug at an early age and couldn't wait to like get out and go live in New York City, you know? And like, what a, what a, you know, seri what an incredible series of fortunate events I had to like get me where I wanted to go. And and just work as hard as as possible. And it's like, and and it's it's funny. I mean, you know, my my Pro Tools operator, Bo, uh, you know, I was working on a whole bunch of stuff at the same time. He's like, man, I can't believe like <laughs> how hard you work at all this stuff. I'm like, you know, you got to You once you get there, you still got to work. Yeah. You know, yeah. you get to where you're going, but you still want to go further. You know, like you get to drive. You know, it's like I just keep relating it to like racing cars and whatever, like you, you learn something and then you want to learn something more. You want to get faster and faster and faster and consistent and, you know, and safe and intelligent and have good race craft. And you can see like the different ages of drivers and, and, and their natural talent and what they can then do with that or not, depending on their, their sort of mindset and their dedication and their focus and, and maturity, maturation and the people they surround themselves with even, you know, and uh, it's, it's all the same stuff, like of being create. Like again, that's the the wonderful thing about what we do the art, the intersection of art and science. I mean, you have more art than I do. You play guitar, like I play drums. I used to, you know. <laughs> I mean, you can make all the drummer jokes in the world; they're all true, um, <laughs> you know. Uh, but you know, it's just so fun to to marry this technical knowledge that we have, and and you know, and and be the paintbrush for the artist, mm. you know? Like John Frusciante is a, obviously a brilliant musician, brilliant songwriter, and he's spent his time out of, the, out of the band for the last 12 years learning how to record, learning how to, you know, make music on the computer and all this stuff. And he comes at what we're doing here in, from such a different mindset, and as do I, like we meet in this middle, you know, and he's got ideas for engineering and how to record things. And I've got ideas for how to get a guitar sound. And so we get to like truly, you know, co-create and, and intersect in so many ways. And, and it's like, and when you, when you leave the ego at the door, when you leave, I have to be right. And this has to be my console. You can't touch my console or my knob or whatever. That was, that sounded weird. <laughs> um, but <laughs> there's always humor in this shit too, by the way. But like when, when, when you can have such like an incredible, like, ha first of all, we've been working together for 20 years, you know, but, but we hadn't for so long and, and we can come back together as more mature individuals and like cooperate on such a deeper level and be influenced, influenced by each other and influential towards the other. Like, I mean, it, it, it's, it's. Yeah, it's definitely one of the most magical records I've ever made in that regard. To 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 learn so much, 
to share so much and to achieve so much and work so fucking hard. We, we weren't working like we were 20 years ago, like till four in the morning or anything like that. But, but like the, pra- the application of what we were doing and the intention of what we were doing were, was, was so much more arguably focused now I understand. Than, than, than then. You so know? much more acquired knowledge. You can get, yeah. you know what you want and you can get there so much quicker. When, you, when you're more mature, you don't need to like wave your dick around all the time. You know, or like show how much you can do. It's like you can show how much you do by not doing it. The amount and the breadth of music that John Frusciante listens to mm-hmm. is mind blowing. He definitely, as a as as a guitar player, has a lot of emphasis on tone. Yeah, on all his sounds being unique. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I mean that's where the modular synthesizer comes in a lot. Um, you know, where he'll play something that's that's, you know when we record it is like, oh, my, I got a cool, I got a really nice acoustic guitar sound here. He's like, yeah, cool, give it to me on the modular. And then he'll go, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> you know, and we did that on us. There's a song, it's all, it's synth based. And it's, it's really interesting. It's like kind of a Noi vibe. And it's got like a very classical chord progression, you know. Noise the, kraut rock. For yeah, me, yeah, the it? German eight, 70s, 80s. 70s. Um, Noi exclamation mark. Yeah, N-E-U exclamation point. Yeah, we put this acoustic on it and and he was like, oh, you know, it just sounds like, oh, now here's an acoustic. Let, well, let's do something to it. And he had, they had already started rehearsals for the tour and everything. He's just like, he's like, oh, you know, put it through the modular and do something like this. And he described a patch to me. You can still tell it's an acoustic guitar, but it's severely affected. And, and it's just, it's interesting how that's become part of the Chili Pepper sound. Mm-hmm. And people don't even realize what's happening. But like, you know, starting... Starting with By the Way, I think that's when he got his, his modular and was f- figuring out how to use it. But if you listen to that record, there's all sorts of phase shifting and filters and shit like that. And it's just gotten more and more technical and more and more an integral part of the songs now. You know, and there's a, there's a bunch of songs on, on the record that have, that are, there's actually, there's one called, um, it's track 12. <laughs> uh, and you'll know it because there's an acoustic guitar that has this burbling sound that fades in and out where we just fade between the affected and the non-affected sound. And it's, it's just like takes a song that could just be a regular acoustic guitar song and it takes it to this whole other place. And it's not a place you've ever been before. You know, I'm going, you know, I'm going back to re-listen to the record now. Uh, I'm going to start like going, oh, that's the one he, uh, yeah, that's what he meant. Yeah. Yes. Everyone's at different places at different yeah. times. Like that's what they, the importance of alignment you know, and what people are doing, right. you know, it's, it's, it's the, that's the alignment I think is the glue between the intent and the experience, you know? Yeah, I agree. You know, and it's like, if you're not, if you're not in it to win it, what are you doing? Well, there was, always, I don't know how true the story was, but I remember when it came out, the joke was with Love Cats by The Cure was that they got a tax bill and it was massive. And Robert's <laughs> just like, we've got to write a pop song. We need to make some money. I got to pay this tax bill. I can't afford it. Yeah. It's one of my favorite songs of theirs, and he hates it, apparently. He goes of course. On the record. Yeah. It's a great song. Yeah. I wish I could write like, uh, I mean, Jesus, if I could just dash that off and, you yeah. know, make a few million. Yeah, I've got to write you know, Yeah, there you go. It's, I mean, it's so, isn't it funny, though, that people are so quick to run away from their commercial success? Ask Gallagher. about Noel Gallagher, right? Yeah. What Fucking stories do you have to him. tell? I love him. Noel Gallagher. I love Oasis. So, oh, my God, I love Oasis. Those records are so fucking good. Yeah, my favorite song of theirs is uh, Live Forever. Unbelievable. Great song. Uh, I saw that Liam played that and dedicated it to Taylor Hawkins the other day. Nice. Uh, Which is great because it's such a good drum song uh, with, that, with that floor tom part at oh, the beginning. Oh, man. Yeah. I mean, I was living in England when that, when uh, when Definitely Maybe came out. Mm. When oh, that you were? Came, Oh, yeah. I was living. I was, in, I, was in, I was going to school in Brighton um, in, ni- in fall of 94. Oasis came out, Jamiroquai. Uh, Radiohead, I was just the Benz, the Benz, what a record! Oh, what the record! And you used to go to these like underground rock clubs, you know, and like get... well, Life of Rubbish should come out earlier. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's such a good mm-hmm. But that. like Creep was the shit at the yeah. time, you know. Yeah. Like every po- oh, and 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 Stone Roses and REM Monster, like all this incredible rock music was coming out in the yeah. uh, like mid nineties. You know? And even the stuff that wasn't rock was amazing because you had Massive Attack, yeah, just head, yeah. Yeah, like no just one, everything no blended one together. at my school in Boston knew what acid jazz was. Oh, really? I'm like, what? Is, this is, this doesn't swing. They're like, no, no, no. It's like dance music. I'm like, 
well, then why do they call it jazz? I don't know. It's, that's what they call it. <laughs> you know, and then I came back to America and brought all this music with me and then went to all the record stores and, and you could buy it for like $2, you right. know, because no one's like, what is this garbage? Didgeridoo's and shit. Oh, you know? God. Jamiroquai, <laughs> so good. I saw, dude, I saw them in New York when I lived in Manhattan in the 90s. I probably saw them 10 times. Amazing. It was, oh man, it was so fun. It was so, that, that I mean, Stuart Zender was so funky. So funky. And, and of course, Jay with his Ferrari addiction, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And, then, and the way he moves on stage. Oh. Because you could do all that, um, what do they oh, call that? Spin around the that spot dancing. Crazy dancing. Yeah, and that, yeah. remember that traveling without moving video? Yeah, yeah. Uh, or virtual insanity, rather, on, yeah, yeah. on the record, traveling without moving. Yeah. I haven't listened to that stuff in ages. I was listening to Jimmy Require this morning, That's for real. So funny. And it was really weird because I was trying to remember what the title was for the song. Do, 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 do. Uh, Too Young to Die. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like how how like boxy and dead the drums are, oh, yeah. and so how good. funky that guy is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Amazing. what was that other band I used to listen to around then? Ah, oh, it's like oh, those brand are new whole, heavies. Br brand new heavies. <laughs> yeah, they yeah. just put out. They just put that record out on vinyl for Record Store Day. Oh, fantastic! Like re-released it, and I tried to get it, and it was yeah. sold out everywhere. I was like, you got to be kidding me! It was such. I a used good to time. go see them in yeah. New York. Oh. Such a good time. I had a funk band in college. Maloko. It was seven, seven Jewish kids from various suburbs playing funk. Nice. Horn section, just instrumental. We'd play frat parties and all that kind of stuff. We had so much fun. We'd watch like 70s black exploitation films as inspiration and like, <laughs> nice. and listen, yeah. And, and I was way into Jamiroquai and this guy was into that and Ohio players and, you know, like all this 70s, like, yeah. oh man, I used to buy all these like funk compilations back in the day. Oh, those are good times. That was great. So fun. And this is all happening at the same time. Yeah. All these genres yeah. are like melting yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah. Such a good But time man, I would love to. I would, man, can you find that? Al Stone, I think was his name, the engineer's name, who did all those records. Is it Al? Yeah. Can you find him and interview that guy? Yeah, let's find oh him. Oh my God. I wonder where he find is. Find Al Stone. Someone find Al Stone. We're going to find Al Stone. I don't Stone. know what else he's ever done. I never bothered to look it up, but I just know it was, his name was Al Stone. Like, I just could not get over like how present that vocal is with not a hint of brightness, not a hint of, of any kind of like harshness. Just, it sounds like this, but it's also so open. And I have no idea how he did it. I mean, it's got to be like some kind of either, it's got to be some kind of ribbon mic. You know who else I would love for you to find is the guy who did those Oasis records. Oh, you mean their, their um, it was their front of house guy. Um, did the first two or three albums first, yeah, for, and he and then he he like did a, a couple songs with um, the Verve, and then he just cut out. He apparently lives in Costa Rica. Just counting his money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's just like, and apparently he was just like, well, how am I going to do better than this? You know, like <laughs> two of the biggest records of the decade. Uh, peace out. <laughs> so I got an interview with him here. Oh, send it to me. Elstone recording. What does he look course. like? I don't even know. I, he doesn't look anything like I imagined him to look. No. That is so funny. He kind of looks like he's more to do with the band and less. I, I, I would have thought more of a He looks John like Mackey. a serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> no offense, Al. I love you. <laughs> Jesus. And I hadn't thought about that record in, in a minute, but I've always wanted to know how it was made. It's such a distinctive sounding record. And same with those Oasis records. I mean, like, can you get any more compressed? Oh yeah. I mean, can you have any more like and like <laughs> on 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 one of the big hits? There's like you can clearly hear the gate opening on the snare, like sure. clear as f***ing day. Yeah. And yeah. everything is just like whoosh, this mountain of f***ing compression. <laughs> but like you couldn't mix that record any other way. Yeah. Like yeah. it sounds like it's just a, like it sounds like the two of them fighting yeah. is what yeah. those records sound like to me. They're just about to. F and explode or fall apart. One of the two. Well, just plus the way when we the way we made records in in, in the UK at the time and the way you made them was so different. I remember the coming over here in uh, October of '95, getting in a car, turning on K Rock, and going like, "Do you really? Does it really just have to be only kick drum? I got to hear it's like kick, snare, kick, 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 snare." Oh. And we just our records just weren't. We didn't mix. No, it's like the that. other way around. Yeah, the, like the Stones. I mean, the Stones are emblematic. You can't you can't make you can't hear the kick drum on yeah. any Stones record. Yeah. You know, and and it's you shouldn't, yeah, because it's not the part of the, it's not the emphasis, the emphasis of the syllable was not correct. 
<laughs> if you put the kick drum up, you know, and 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 just to make it more about me, um, <laughs> the part you were asking about how we mix on here, and yeah. like you, we were talking about people whose faders are dancing all over the place, yeah. and that's normally how I used to mix. Is lots, you know, I come from the, you know, I, I worked for Michael Brower, and Michael likes to push and pull and whatever, and I swear to God, if I moved anything, John would come in and listen with his eyes, swears with eyes closed, like. And he'd look down and see I was right. He's like, why are you riding the fader? I'm like, well, just to give it a little thing. He's like, you don't need to. I already did that. Right, right. And if I compressed something the wrong way that changed the groove, he'd be like, is there compression on that? And sometimes it was a good thing. Sometimes it was a bad, sometimes he wanted it. Sometimes he didn't want it. And I'd be like, and I started to say, why? Yeah. <laughs> Before I'd answer him yes or no. And, and he's like, man, the groove, he's like, can we, can we, make it so that d that doesn't happen. I'm like, yeah, yeah, of course, here you go. He's like, yeah, now, do you hear how the groove is changed now? Like, turn it back on. And, and you see how it's emphasizing this instead of this, you know, or whatever. He'd do movements or like, yeah. you know, and I was like, yeah, wow, okay. You know, and it's just interesting how how it all plays into each other. And sometimes you need this. Sometimes people that you're mixing don't put the funk into it. Right. And you got to push it and pull it and do the thing. But with a band like this that's cut all together yeah. and playing off each other, you don't have to do that sure. as much. It's like you just get a balance. It's like an old school record where you get a balance, you touch a couple things, and it's pretty much done, you yeah. know? Yeah. But it's not. You know, there's so much more to it. Then there's more subtleties beyond that, you know? I remember Ciccarelli telling me um, years and years ago, no, we were, we were on the panel together in, in Nashville. Mm-hmm. When we did the panels together, remember Ciccarelli said that um, it was it was um, it was pride. He goes, I wanted the next guy who was going to work on the record to do the vocal overdub to just pull everything up on fader, pan yeah. it in the right position, and it sound like the record. Go. Yeah, he goes, it was pride. Yeah, yeah, but but that again, that's true engineering. You know, like the Blink record I did in two thousand three with Jerry Finn. You know, that was our goal. You know, and and I'd always seen classic and that's how my dad did it in the truck like all of his monitor faders started out at zero and he'd gain he'd do his gain staging into the mix same thing so that when you get it back to the studio you just put the faders up and there's 90 percent of your mix and like with the blink record we spent so much time getting each sound and each thing together and i'd always have the faders in a row and we'd get the sound so it played played well with others how know? was it working with jerry oh man he was the best I think about him nearly every day. You know, I only did two records with him. I did that self-titled Blink and I did a Alkaline Trio record with him. But like he probably had more influence on me than any other single person. Wow. Just in terms of work ethic, details, focus, uh, getting the job done. And also just how to be a producer with many hats. He could play a little bit of guitar. He, he was an incredible engineer, mixer. A and R person, you know, songsmith. He didn't write songs, but he could tell you how it needed to flow. Like a mega punk rock fan, you know. I mean, he did obviously mostly punk pop and punk rock, and you know, the Odd Morrissey record. But you know, he was so into getting his hands dirty, you know. And oh my God, we had so much, and he was just so fucking funny, man. We yeah. had we had so much fun we'd go out to dinner you know just like just hanging out outside the studio you know we had, we had a friendship and oh man it makes me so sad yeah, he didn't he die from the same thing on the same age as his father or something no well, he was adopted um oh so, so he that. didn't have any family like he you know he had an adopted oh. family his parents a completely different story his parents both died when he was f not young but you know early no in his 20s or third early 30s maybe mm -hmm. and he just had his sister um at the end and, oh, my God, it was heartbreaking. I'll never forget that call. Because he was, he was like our age. 39. He was, it was he younger was than us. 39 years oh old. God. He didn't even get to 40. Oh, dear. And when I think, like, I'm 47 now. Wow. I think I, it was, he passed in 2008. I think I was, I mean, I, I only know that because I was just setting up my first studio in Venice. Uh, and, yeah, I'll never forget that. It was like... I didn't he was that young. Oh, man. Just a, what a f***ing kick in the teeth. But, you know, it's like we just, we carry on in his honor. Like, you know, I mean, funny story. Like, I mean, 2003, eBay was young, right? Sure. eBay was still... You could get, still get a deal. You yeah. get deals on eBay I at the deals, time. Yeah. He had never heard of it. And he was a gear whore. Like, you wouldn't believe. He collected... I mean, when he passed, I think he had 150 guitars, 
100 amps, hundreds and hundreds of pedals, and racks and racks of gears. Anyway, we, we start this, this Blink record, and his favorite thing was summing, you know, two amps, two cabinets, two mics on each cabinet, summed all together, all four mics down to one track. And he would sum it through a Manly Poltec. And, you know, and he only had one. And so everything, all the guitars we did went through that one Manly Poltec. I was like, man, this thing sounds amazing. I'd go on eBay. I'm like, and I was, it was the first, my, my first true engineering gig, you know, from start to finish. And, you know, I was making a couple dollars. I'm like, oh man, these are great. And I see one on eBay, you know, a pair, consecutive serial number pair for $2,000. Wow. And I was like, wow, that's a pretty good deal. I was like, hey, Jerry, you know, do you want to buy one of these? You said you wanted to get another one. Uh, you know, I don't know if I can really afford to get both of these. Like, oh no, f- that. I only have consecutive serial number pairs of everything. That's all I do. And I'm like, okay, great. I'm like, you know what? F- it. I'm buying both. I shit you not. They show up. His is number 196, 197, 198. <laughs> and he's like, oh, well, now, now I'll take 197. I'm like, no, f- you. I got a consecutive serial number pair. I'm not giving it to you. And he's like, oh, come on. And he was so mad, you know, in like in the, in the nicest, friendliest way. But he, oh, he would never let me live it down. And I, he's like, you're going to sell me that EQ yet? I'm like, nope. <laughs> are those them there? Those are them right there. Oh, wow. And, sure. you know, and, and it's funny because like, you know, when I was talking about like, you know, being in the box and selling off all my stuff, I'm like, I can't sell those. Those are my Jerry Finney cues, man. Oh, nice. And so it's like... You still use them on guitars? Uh-huh. Yeah, I used them on the guitars on, on some songs. Is there songs any little record. secret stuff? I mean, you know, Jerry's thing was 1.5K full bandwidth yeah. and 120 with a bit of boost and a bit of cut, you know, just depending on, you know, to make that sort of bump in the bottom end of the guitars. Mm-hmm. And I mean, every song on... I mean, gosh, we... I mean, every, every both records we made went through uh, his Manleys and my Manleys, actually, and, and, uh, after I got them. Because uh, then we wound up doing stereo guitar sounds, and we could, now we got two Manly EQs, man. We can put everything through it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, they're, 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 they're pretty great. I mean, they're, they're different. I mean, I've got, like, retro Poltex here. I've got real Poltex over there. I've got Langs. Um, and they, they're all, they all have, like, a different character. And the thing I like about those, those Manleys is they go down to 1K, which is really true guitar range for me for like aggressive mid-range um especially you know especially for the music that he did like that punk pop stuff was very like he he made those guitars very specifically um mid-range aggressive and you know that was that was my sound for a long time was that you know his his influence on me it's really really cool um but yeah that was that was that was one of the one of our fun tricks Amazing. Like that sound. Yeah, yeah. It's it's cool. So I, I don't think I can ever sell those. <laughs> as much as like, you know, I don't I don't use them as much as I used to. Um, but yeah, it's it's like kind of a touchstone. I have two of his guitars too. When when um when his sister uh was selling his his collection, I wound up I don't play guitar, you know, but I wanted to. I wanted I, you know, in my copious fucking free time, I wanted to learn how to play guitar. <laughs> what guitars but, did you get? Uh I have a, a custom shop Telly Jr. Nice. Which is, they made a hundred of those. And his TV yellow, he bought it while we were doing Blink. So I was like, I got to have that one. And I have a gold top Les Paul reissue that was not one of his favorite guitars, but it was like, he really liked it. Yeah, I think he had 10 or 12 Les Pauls, you know, of different, of varying types. You know, he had specials, customs, et cetera. He had one that he that he had custom made. So it had, um, uh, it was, the intonation was, it was it was evenly was it what is it what do they call it even intonation like a piano where instead of instead of having wonky stuff he had it custom fretted or something well, that piano they call equal temperament equal temperament he had he had something done to it where it was not you know like a normal guitar is not really in tune i guess you right. know so he had an even he had it made even tempered and it, it was basically unplayable unless you were doing very specific things but you know it was just like an, it was it was a tool for him you know he'd use it in one out of ten records you know but it was a thing and then he had all these other ones with mini humbuckers and p90s and this and that and the other thing and he's like all right oh this part yeah you want to play this guy and all of them had names you know oh you want hig you want this guy you know you oh you want this guy you know and and he would just play with these guitars and let other people play them until he figured out what its specialty was, and that's when they came out. And he actually had three Telly Juniors, and back then, like when he bought them, you can get them for like a thousand bucks, you know. And now they're very expensive. I think they're like 
well, not very, but like, you know, five, seven thousand dollars or something like that. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, but it's like, it's, it's a guitar, you know, it's, a, it's the only Fender that they made that has a neck through body. Mm -hmm. So there's no bolt on neck, like every other Fender guitar under the sun. And apparently the guy who, who came up with it got fired because <laughs> oh, wow. it was like, you know, it was not, it doesn't sound like a Fender. It sounds like a Les Paul, as you'd imagine. It's a chambered mahogany body. It's got P90s in it, like a Les Paul special. I remember when they were selling them at Guitar Center, maybe, 20 years ago and yeah. they, you, they were pretty much giving them away. Yeah, no one wanted them because yeah. it wasn't a Fender and now it's just like, well, fuck, it's, that's pretty cool. It doesn't have that twang yeah. like, a tele, like a regular telly has, you know, like, like a, a standard American telly has, but it's got its own yeah. thing and people like, uh, Josh Homme picked it up. He's like, he's like, wow, this guitar looks terrible, but fuck, it sounds cool. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's got, um, the back of the neck is lacquered also. So it's not, it doesn't have like that sort of natural wood feel. Right. And I right. think the neck is shaped like a, like a, like a thin Les Paul rather than like the, the telly shape. Oh. So it's like, it's not, it's a huge departure from a regular oh. Fender guitar. And I'm talking out my ass. I barely know anything about guitars, no, but I know but, these things. <laughs> no, I, but I remember seeing one in Guitar Center when you walk in, they'd have that, that rack near the yeah, front. Yeah. It was like, everything was a little bit cheaper. Uh -huh. And I remember looking at it going, oh, that looks pretty cool. Now I wish I bought it. I think it was like eight fifty. Yes, yeah, I like all the weird <laughs> guitars. I like the their Fender makes a Cabron Tele that's got like uh, Filtertron pickups in it. Mm. It's so wicked, it's so cool, and it's like a cheap guitar, you know. But it's got like again, it doesn't sound like your regular sure. Tele with the with the little single coils in it. I mean, it's a big thing for us now, isn't it? Always looking for things that are just a little bit different. Yeah, they're a little outside the norm because <clears throat> we're yeah. so used to hearing perfection almost. Yeah, well, I mean, and you know. That's the other interesting thing about all this shit is like y you come in day to day and it's not the same, you know. I mean, like I mean, I I'll send Rick a mix from one day to the next. He's like, it's like he's like something's different. Like, is the voltage different? Like, and I'm looking. I had a voltage meter over there. I'm like, no, it's one eighteen all day, man. I don't know, um, you know. And I'll listen like super hard and get like, do you hear any difference? I'm like, I don't hear any difference. <laughs> but you know, it's like, well, maybe did you eat the same breakfast? <laughs> you know, because like everything affects everything. Our mood when we walk into the studio affects how we hear yeah. and how we perceive. And, you know, and one of my other touchstones lately is like we create our own reality. Sure. You know, like how we see and hear and feel the world is different day to day, depending on yep, I agree. everything. You know, it's like why it's important to get sleep and yep. a little bit of exercise, have love in your life and all this other stuff that's, yep. that's yep. beyond like a computer, beyond you know, sure. just what we do. There's just, there's so much more to life and, and, and how we do this stuff and how we're able to work the long hours and be creative and stuff like that. You know, that's, a, that's the topic for a whole other interview. <laughs> I'm, I'm down. Let's do another one. Well, this I is fantastic. We need like a health and wellness segment. Ryan, thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. That was so fun. That was a lot of fun. Thanks for coming over. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. Yes. And uh, so long. Farewell. Have a good day. Au revoir. Uh, two zines. I don't know. Salmonella. Salmonella. <laughs>